approved it. Uh, it's the Rural Nepal Health and Education Project. Um, there's also a flyer about the project on the back table. It's this flyer here, if you want to know more about it. There's a lot of good details on here. Our mission here at the Peace Center is um, to strive to create a world where our collective needs are met sustainably and nonviolently. And we support Jitman Bosnet's efforts for justice after forced disappearances and torture and even deaths occurred at the hands of the military in Nepal. And I just want to add that this is not a story of something happening in a country far away. This is also happening in our backyard. Uh, impunity for torture, war crimes, waterboarding, black sites. The perpetrators of these crimes against human rights and international law walk freely. Former President George W. Bush just had a presidential library dedicated to himself last week. So I just wanted to welcome Catherine Hughes-Freitech of Peace Brigades International, who will be introducing Jitman Bosnet. Um, PBI, Peace Brigades International, uh, sponsors Jitman, as, who is a human rights lawyer and a journalist. And if you haven't heard of PBI or Peace Brigades International, it's an international NGO that protects human rights workers who are in danger for their work by providing protective accompaniment in Nepal, Mexico, and Colombia. So without further ado, uh, Catherine, Catherine Hughes Freitech of Peace Brigades International. So hello, welcome, and namaste to all the, yeah? We um, are actually really excited tonight um, with this program to work with the Center for Peace and Justice and Peace Brigades International, and as um, Sue mentioned, a new project that we're working on that is looking at the fact that when you have human rights abuses or issues story, which he's got a long story, but he actually um, helped build a school um, for children in his village, which is in the northeast region of Nepal, right near Mount Everest, and it's interesting, our film is called Beneath Everest, so it's very appropriate, um, because he, as growing up, had to walk two and a half hours to school and back across rivers, through um, little tracks, um, through a forest, which I'm sure some of the Nepalis here probably can relate to as well. Um, and it was really tough to get the education to continue to do that. And especially for girl children, um, Dalit children and others, um, it can be very difficult. And their families may be really struggling and they end up having to do domestic work. And so they can't end up getting an education and kind of moving on with their lives. Um, and so we're looking at a project that will look at dealing with that issue with um, scholarships and education area, as well as rural um, health clinics, which are also badly needed um, across Nepal uh, at this point. So again, we're hoping that long term, the Nepalis are extremely hard workers, um, and they are actually having to work many places in the world right now, rather than their own countries at times because of the economic situation and because it's not as stable right now politically, um, but they're really hard workers. And they're going to be able to deal with all these things and develop their own country well. But in the interim, as they're trying to get stability and move forward, we're hoping to partner with them in various ways. And I know when we travel around the country and meet a lot of Nepalis as well, they have a lot of their own projects. And they're sending money back and creating a lot of projects as well. So tonight, we're kind of looking tonight and tomorrow night at connecting the human rights issues, peace and justice issues with humanitarian issues because we think they are very deeply created. And many times issues around conflict or revolution that are po political actually arise out of humanitarian needs at the same time. So there, there's a continuum and they're all actually connected. Um, Sue introduced me. I'm the executive um, director of Peace Brigades International, the USA component. Our main office is in Washington, DC. So I travel both around the country, um, within Europe, where we have a lot of our meetings where some of our other offices are, and our coordination office, which is in London. And then in the field, we have offices, as you mentioned, Mexico, Guatemala, Colombia. We'll be moving to Honduras this year because of all the requests for us to move in and to support human rights activists there. We're also just moving into Kenya, in Africa, and we've been in Nepal since 2006, 2007. We're still there. 
and we're moving back into Indonesia. Um, we were pushed out from um, Papua, which is it's very tough to be there. Even the International Red Cross was, was asked to leave a couple of years ago. Um, but we're finding a new model where we'll probably be based in Jakarta, but be able to have the human rights activists come back and forth and try to help protect them with a little different model. So our organization, it's been around about 31 years, um, and we have a model that we've developed that's called protective accompaniment. A lot of times I have a slideshow, but because we're trying to focus on, on the movie and other speakers too, I'm not gonna do as long of a presentation. Um, but if you're interested, you could talk to me later as well. Um, our main model is that we have international volunteers who have t-shirts, and you'll see some of them, um, I guess not in the movie now, but big t-shirts that say PBI. Um, and over, when we move into a country, we're always locally requested. So there'll be a journalist, there'll be a human rights defender, there'll be a community that's at risk and being targeted with death threats, um, they're burning houses down, they're arresting their leaders on false charges because they're doing human rights activism. And our mandate requires that that activism always be nonviolent. So there are things, civil society issues, like they're building schools possibly and being attacked, or they're reporting on um, journalistic issues that are controversial, or they're, as in Jitman's case, defending human rights um, victims that um, it's very sensitive because of the, the perpetrators and where they sit in power. Um, and we physically walk around with these people. Our nickname is the unarmed bodyguards, so that gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, two people at a time, at any one time, for safety's sake. We have a house where all the volunteers live in one spot and work together. They're from all over the world, Global North and Global South, um, North America and Europe. And then we have a backup network that is what really makes this work, where if someone gets in danger, that team will let us know, we'll be there physically with the person, so that they're putting a, a spotlight on what's happening. There's an international witness, so that maybe a paramilitary or a checkpoint or an army official um, will back off a bit and won't move forward and attack that they would without the international there. But we're backed up by international networks all across the world where I'll get a call or uh, an email will come through for an alert like it did yesterday in Mexico saying in Oaxaca, a group called Codiga, um, and Alba Cruz is an attorney there um, who's been a, a great risk, that they were targeted, their offices were ransacked, and one of her staff had been arrested on false charges. Right away, we get in touch with the U.S. Congress in the U.S., maybe the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, maybe the U.N. in New York, depending on the situation, um, maybe the State Department, who we meet with to get information about human rights abuses often, and then they will use their pressure on the government of Mexico or contact our ambassador there and have them go out and make sure that that government is following international law and its guidelines, which is to protect civilian protesters or protect civilian people. And that's their responsibility under international and mostly national law. Um, it gets trickier when some of the countries we're in do not have a really good implementation of national law. And so, for instance, in Nepal right now for human rights issues, um, there is 100% impunity. That's actually the, the hardest country we work on in this issue where not one single case of at least 16,000 killed and over thousands and thousands disappeared people, there's not one case that's gone to court and been prosecuted yet. And so it's a really, it's a hard struggle. And the, the bottom line is you want to move on to peace and forgiveness and um, get past it, but if you don't have justice for the victims or the communities, then the perpetrators, those people, which it could be the Maoists or the Nepal army or others, um, they'll repeat it. They'll feel like, well, I did it once and I got away with it, I'll just keep doing it. And so that creates a society where it's not safe, the human rights activists that are trying internally to push for their own activism, own um, advancement, are being targeted and are being threatened and sometimes killed. So Peace Brigades International is um, nonpartisan. We don't stand on either side. We stand for human rights and justice, but we're not standing on either side of the issue. And so in that case, we act as a firewall for the people on the ground, the activists, to be able to do their work. We don't want to tell them how to do it. We may not know it as well as they do because they're based in their own country. They know their own culture and how things work. But we create a safe space for peace for them to do their work and to continue to do it. So that's our mission. At any one time, we may have up to 80 volunteers in the field around the world in these teams. Uh, if anyone's interested to volunteer, we'd love to have you. We have all ages. 
Normally it's about 24 as our youngest because it's a lot of responsibility being on these teams um, and protecting human rights activists and there can be some pretty crazy situations, um, pretty dangerous situations. One of the key things we're very proud of is that we've never lost a volunteer. So in all of these years, 31 years, um, we never lost someone. Um, and so that's a, that shows that we've really had a good system in place for the deterrence. Um, again, part of this is a very key analysis. So let's say we're working with um, an activist in Colombia on the ground from a, a community, San Jose de Apartado, which is a peace community. We actually sponsored a speaker through Albuquerque. Bobby was there, mom and dad. Um, who actually came um, a couple years ago and we did a national tour and he's one of the main founders of this peace community and PBI actually accompanies the whole community and we were with them when they went back in to reclaim their land in 1997 after the paramilitaries pushed them off. It's been very dangerous for them. Some of them have actually been injured or killed over the years but they tell us that without peace brigades there and some other international accompaniers, they would not have been able to go back and they would not be growing the villages and reclaiming their land and doing organic farming and kind of taking back their lives like they've been able to do. So, um, so that's kind of how it works. In that case, we do a lot of analysis on who are the perpetrators? Um, is it the government? Is it state level people? Is it local people? And will our deterrence method work, which is to put pressure mainly on the government um, to make sure that violence doesn't happen anymore? So a lot of times in Mexico, another example, Guatemala, some of the drug cartels, you know, the government will say, oh, we have nothing to do with them. But when we do our analysis behind the scenes, we know that there are close connections and that if the government were to put pressure on those drug cartels, they'll back off. Um, so there is a connection and so we do a lot of analysis on security analysis We call it how it works so we know what deters and the key is to make the cost To those perpetrators of violence more than the benefit and So that's how the unarmed bodyguard which you would never think that two or three unarmed international people Walking by a person who's threatened by a well-armed army could actually keep that person safe, but it actually works We've had a really good history over the years and no matter where we are, we have more and more requests than we can actually fulfill. So I hope that you'll stay in touch. You're on our, our list now, and we can stay in touch with you. And the more we have partnerships and, and people from all over that are aware, that can do some emergen re emergency responses, that helps the process move forward. So with that, I'm going to introduce um, Jitman Baznet. I'm very honored to have worked with him over the past several years. I met Jitman in 2008. Um, Peace Brigades International has accompanied him for a while, and he'll tell you with his story. He's going to talk and tell you his story. As Sue said, he's really the most important person here because the film that we're going to show and the one we're showing, he's very connected with the whole history of the country of human rights activism. Um, the one was actually the story and was based on the torture that he underwent um, in 2004, um, and he was disappeared by the army, and I'll let him tell you the story. But he is an amazing survivor. Um, he got out, um, he moved forward, and actually saved the lives of 29 people that were there with him under great um, threat to himself. And then has had to go in exile many times back and forth, but always heads back to Nepal to try to continue his work because he feels so strongly about helping his own people and his country move forward and getting justice. And we've been, um, for the last two years, he's been in the U.S. due to, to safety issues. Um, um, he was, uh, there was an attempted attack on him in June 2011 in Nepal, um, and he had to, to come out, and Peace Brigades helped him do that. And we've been doing tours, advocacy work, speakers tours all over the country, and it's been amazing how we've been able to highlight the issue of Nepal. Uh, and hopefully trying to get some pressure to move forward and some awareness of it. And also the lovely things about Nepal, because he talks about those as well, uh, the culture, the people. And I really enjoyed meeting so many people around the country, too, from Nepal. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jitman. Um, he'll, as I said, tell his story. We'll show you the film. But I think you'll find really, it's really interesting. It's also being shown at several film festivals around the country right now. And then we'll have kind of a response to him, a formal response to some of the issues that it raises. And then uh, Sue and I and him will do a, a question and answer session where we can have some discussion toward the end. So thank you for coming. And Jimin, go ahead.
Namaste. Thank you very much for coming here. I'm honored today to be with you. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you, uh, Susan Scrumman. And uh, I have a whole bunch of lists I want to thank. You know, you have you have done so much for for human rights, peace, and justice around the globe, locally and internationally. Before starting, uh, we are very sad to hear. Just recently, we lost uh, Rosamund Evans, a great human being, a great ac activist. That is the property of ours, our human beings, our human societies. We we need more people, those kind of people. And when we l we lose those people, and we, we extremely we. We become sad. So uh, I want to pay my tribute to, to her and her work, and we will, we will remember you always, forever, forever. We will keep you in our mind and our heart and our society. We will we'll remember you forever. And we have so many. This is an uh, incredible city, a place. That so many people are activists here, and I love activism. Thank you very much for uh, sponsoring this program. Uh, I want to thank to Peace and uh, Albuquerque Center for uh, Peace and Justice, Peace Brigade International, United Nations uh, Association, uh, Albuquerque Chapter, uh, and uh, thank you Nancy and Herb. They are working, you know, maybe a couple of for a couple of months, you know, uh, informing, uh, providing inf information to their networks. And Bob, uh, Bobby is here. Uh, uh, <coughs> Susan uh, Carr, Rita, uh, Heldegar, yeah, so many. And, and my Nepali friends and all participants, I, I wanna thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining with us today. I have only 10 minutes, so many things will, Moby will speak itself. And previous speaker, Sh Susan and Catherine, they are most of the issues they covered up. I will not, uh, I forgot, I, I saw um, uh, Ravi, he also helped, uh, you know, supporting the program. Thank you, Ravi. I will not talk that much about the beauty of Nepal. I will not talk about Mount Everest and beautiful land, those rivers, second largest capacity, hydroelectricity capacity. It's dark now. I will not talk, uh, you know, touristic destination, about touristic destinations. I will talk about our struggle, how Nepalese people, they, they have been, they have been struggling for, for years, for years since 1951, to get freedom, to enjoy within the democracy. We have been fighting, we have been struggling for years, and so many Nepalese people, they have lost their lives, they have lost their family members, beloved family members, and still our struggle is going on. We had 239 years long monarch to get rid of monarch, to kick out the monarch from, from the system, we had to sacrifice. So many Nepalese people had to sacrifice their life. And it's still, it's still, there is no monarch today, but there are many kings. So many kings. One kings we, we kicked out, but there, there are so many kings, which are the trouble for, for, for our country. I started working, uh, in human rights and justice, uh, just after the Maoist movement started in 1996, and uh, until 2006, and it, it was 10 years conflict. It, uh, people say armed confli conflict, people's revolution, civil war, whatever. During this time, so many human rights violations occurred across the country, uh, in Nepal. 
I witnessed personally as, as a journalist, as a lawyer, I witnessed uh, people were disappeared, their family members were illegally detained, tortured, and killed, extra, uh, extrajudicially killed, executed by, by Royal Nepal Army and by Maoists. It's a 90% cases are from, happen from the government side and 10% uh, from Maoist side. So both, both uh, in human rights violation, both are responsible. One is the ratio, percentage of the case. I was a journalist and I, I wrote an editorial for my ma magazine. It's called Sagarmatha Time. It's the Nepali name of Mount Everest. I was an editor of that magazine. I wrote an editorial about King's asset. Our King was a very 99% people, they were, you know, poor. They were having a problem, you know, uh, they were dealing with, with poverty. And most of the land properties were captured by the by lim limited family. And rest of people were below poverty line and they were struggling. They had to go to across India and other countries for a job to feed the, their family members. It's still going on now. Nepalese people, they are very honest and very hardworking people. They are. They, they believe in work. But they are poor. Why? Why they, are, they, have, they have been suffering from, from poverty, although they work very hard. 18 years, if you look at in, in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, in our Arabian country, if you look, look at them, 18, year, 18 hours a day they are working. Still they are not been able to, you know, to feed their family. So I wrote that article in, in Sagarmatha Times in November 2003, and in the same issue, I, I wrote an article about Doromba massacre where 29, 21 civilians were killed during a siege fire by the by Royal Nepal Army. And uh, my hard days started. I had to leave home. I had to change my location. I had to, uh, you know, hide somewhere underground, sometimes in friend's house, sometimes relat relative's house, sometimes, uh, you know, outside of Kathmandu, inside of Kathmandu. And in, in February 2004, I was arrested by Royal Nepal Army. Before that, in 2002, I was uh, kidnapped by Maoist and tortured almost one day. And two, two years later, in, in February 2004, I was arrested by Royal Nepal Army and kept in a military, secret, mm, secret military detention, underground detention. And I spent 6,192 hours blindfolded and all the time hands were tied on back. I didn't see human faces during all entire time. And I witnessed how people were treated, how people were killed, how a human being can, can do those things. We, we never imagined. I witnessed that. Although I, I was blindfolded, I, I realized you know, from my internal eyes, third eye, my two eyes were blindfolded, covered, but I had a third eye. I realized I saw those things, how people were killed, how people were raped, without medication, without water, you know, how they were, they died inside the military custody. And they, their whereabouts, their stories, their information were never provided to their family. And they lied, Nepal government lied, always lied to, to the court and international community. We never arrested anyone. You are open to this. But their military barracks across the country were full with the civilian deta detainees, without charges, charges, without any formal charges. I spent nine months, 6,000 six, uh, 6, hours, 258 days without any formal charges, without any information. I was inside and they, they were telling to court, we haven't arrested Chitman, he's not in our custody. There were many people there. They were lying to the world, not lying to imagination, lying to their own people, their court. 
And because of uh, pressure, national and international pressure, I was released after 258 days in 2004. And, and for the first time in Nepalese history, I challenged to the monarch through the legal, legal level. Catherine Mens uh, earlier Catherine Benson, uh, 29 people, they were, they were left. There were hundreds of people inside with me, but um, during that time, most of the people, they died or they transferred, or they, you know, what happened, we don't know. And 29 people uh, remained at, uh, at last, last point before my release. And they requested me, Jitman, you, you, you can write, you are a lawyer, you are a journalist, you can, play a role to save our life, human life, um, our life. We, 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 we didn't have permission to talk verbally. We, we had only three, three words we could speak at that time, only water, toilet, and home. No eno enough adequate food, no water, no treatment at all. I was released, but on condition that I had to meet people, uh, army people or army personnel every 15 days, twice a, twice a month, that they were following me, where I am going, what I am doing. And every time they had to, uh, they, they used to threaten me not to tell any, anything about the military custody, anything about other people. I was, you know, confused what to do, you know. People's, people are suffering uh, inside, and they have asked, I have seen, you know, witnessed their condition. Anytime they could have, in, they could kill, could be killed. <coughs> and I decided one person can be killed, but 30, um, 29 people can be saved. So I choose that uh, side that I don't care. I don't, I'm, I would not stop my voice. I started cam uh, campaign to, to get them out from the military custody. I went to Amnesty International Office, United Nations, mm, local human rights organizations, Supreme Court, National Human Rights Commission. You know, every, everywhere where you know, I could go that time. But on the other, other hand, any time they could have you know, arrested me. I didn't care that. And I, I, wit I, I was a witness in National Human Rights Commission. And National Human Rights Commission mentioned my name as a witness and that the, the report was submitted to Supreme Court and Army got the copy. And my hard, hardest day started again. That I had to quit my regular routine meeting with, with them. My journalist friend, they, they asked me, Jitman, don't meet them. They have found a report. Your name is Minson, mentioned, so be safe, how you could. So I didn't have, I, I didn't have any, any safe place in Kathmandu, so I went to United Nations office. They managed shelter in, uh, in a Swiss diplomat's house, and I was rescued in 2005 when a uh, country was declared uh, emergency, and all entire power was captured by uh, King, and many, many uh, civilians, journalists, human rights activists, politicians were arrested, and, and I, I left country and I came to India. I spent two years, went back to Nepal again after uh, changes, political changes, when the, uh, the political parties and Maoists, they came together and started the joint uh, movement, political movement against the monarch, and finally they got succeed. And uh, I went back to Nepal and started again uh, the campaign against impunity. So many victims were on the ground, they were asking for justice for years, years. And I, I myself, you know, uh, I tried to get justice and for others, uh, I started supporting them.
And first time I, I filed the case against King in Nepal and, and top military generals. Uh, I wrote a book, Catherine so mentioned earlier. Uh, I staged hunger strike in front, in front of parliament demanding uh, the high level investigation commission. Uh, we established a lawyers forum for com um, human rights that works for uh, poor people, women, and human for human rights act um, uh, violation, victims of human rights violation, abuses. We provide free uh, legal services to them. Uh, we support them. We have uh, um, a number of uh, networks throughout the country, and we we have volunteer lawyers, and we support them. And when I uh, I can't remember, it, it, it was in 2007 when I started working with PBI and PBI started supporting me, protecting me when you know, I got a death, death threat from a known phone call uh, because of my work, because of my voice. And again, I had to leave the country with the help of United Nations and uh, Danish Embassy and the PBI. I can remember that day when I, I went to U United Nations office asking for help, uh, support, protections, and they, they didn't have a uh, you know, mechanism on the ground that time. And, and I didn't know about PBI at that time. And they suggested me to go to the PBI office. And, and I went and knocked door, and our relation started from that point. So yeah. Uh, we, we have been, it's still a struggle is going on. Our boys ha uh, haven't been stopped. So many cases are pending. Victims are waiting for justice. Catherine said 100% impunity. It's the same. Political parties, all political parties, government and most, both groups, government groups and, and, and most groups, they were agreed in 2006 to form a transitional uh, mechanism, Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Disappearance Commission within 60 days of signature. That it's, it's been six years. No commission has been formed. None of the uh, perpetrators has, has been brought to the justice. We tried to file a fire uh, in, in the police station, police reject. Police doesn't. Poli one, once we, we were in Solo Combo, just close to Mount Everest. Solo Combo police and the PBI team was also with, the, with, with us. And without a dead body, we cannot register a fire. What a shame. A police officer, the chief of the police, of, you know, local police, responds to us Jitmanji, we cannot register a fire. For, no, we cannot start investigation without a dead body. It's, Eight years ago, we had a discussion. He threw files. We had to leave, you know, police office. There are so many, so many other other issues. Later, we found he was also involved in killing. I think uh, I crossed my barrier, uh, ten minutes barrier. <laughs> so many things you will see. It's a great movie. Uh, Tulsi Bhandari. He supported us, providing movie at last stage. Uh, so explain how we we were we are unable to to screen both sala we had planned earlier because of visa denial of uh, producer mm, director and at the last minute uh, Tulsi Bhandari it's a great movie it's the broader it you know uh, it covers broader overviews of Nepal uh, and I I, I want to thank to Tulsi Bhandari and he he, he also he, you know he has a it's a long history of a struggle. I, I helped him, my team, Lawyers Forum for Human Rights, helped him uh, on the ground in Nepal when he was having some problem, uh, legal problem, and we were supporting, we supported them. So enjoy with the film. And uh, later, if you have any questions, we will be with you. Okay. I did hear reports on the news, but I didn't have a context to put them in. I knew there was a Maoist rebellion going on, but I, I didn't have the fuller context. Um, also, I, 
I observed um, tremendous courage on the part of the people who had the courage to get in the street and call for the, uh, the monarchy to step down. That took incredible courage. And then finally, I was moved by the courage of the filmmaker. Um, I, that really moved me, maybe because of my uh, background yeah. in video. But um, now Jitmon is going to give us a brief uh, update, because this film was made in 2010. Ten. So he'll give a brief uh, update since the film was made, and then we'll take questions. Um, and we need to turn off the projector, because I think it's in our eyes and it's hot. Just hit that button twice. Thanks, Robbie. Huh. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you, Sue. Uh, thank you very much for your patience and uh, your time. Uh, the movie, is, it, it's a little bit longer. It's a long you know, documentary, but it gives a lot of information what's what happened in Nepal, actually. So, so many people visit, uh, visit to Nepal. They, they don't feel in depth what is going on there. They, they see beautiful mountains, rivers, beautiful, you know, people are, life, general life is going on. So what's the problem? In various form, uh, for forums uh, I spoke, people asked this question. I have just recently I visited Nepal. There's no, nothing is going on. You know, from touristic point of views, or a tourist just visit country, climb mountains, enjoy his his time, but don't feel, you know, they don't feel actually what is in depth problem in Nepal, what is going on, what happened. And when we speak in in, uh, in the program, they listen, they hear, they know all these kind of issues and this the, the you know they express the, <coughs> their views oh we are not angry we just visited nothing is going on there this video just only explains until 2010 after 2010 so many things happened so many things political parties i don't blame to people people you know one one guy is he he was nepali congress supporter he voted to Mao's. He he had a lot of hope from from the po political changes. You know, uh, you know, uh, more than sixty years long people's uh, uprising movement, ten years long insurgency, and uh, you know a, a long history of people's struggle, and they had a lot of hope as a citizen, as an activist, as a, a victim. You know. I had a lot of hope that our country, 26 million people, hardworking people, beautiful land, you know, a lot of rivers. We, we are second largest capacity, hydro cap capacity, uh, electricity capacity in the world after Brazil. You know, beautiful land, anything you can grow, anything you can grow. We are poor. Why? I don't blame to the people. The, the reason I blame to those who, who enjoyed their power, they, they didn't care about people. They didn't ca care about you know, people's various uh, you know, uh, different uh, ethnic groups, you know, discrimination, caste discrimination. I want to I wanna tell one story. Why Mao's movement started from, from uh, Rukum Rolpa, from a very poor community. The question is, people from the, uh, you know, those, those areas, they didn't have access to, to the government. They were very far from, from the capital. They didn't have access, health access. Their children, they, uh, they couldn't send to school. They had to go to India for, for work, six month work, and, go, and come back to Nepal. Again, after six months, go, go back to India and come back to Nepal. Why it happened? Because we, we people, we, we, we tried. The transformation, changes, for positive changes, we tried. And people, you know, they, they sacrificed their life. 
didn't, didn't change. We are a constitution and assembly, 601 inclusive constitution assembly to draft a new constitution, to give a new face of Nepal. Everyone, people, leaders, everyone was telling, new Nepal. What is new Nepal? Constitution assembly could not draft the constitution within, within two years, and they extended time. Six months, one year, six months, and finally last year, constitution assembly dissolved. Those people you, you saw in the movies, they were enjoying, with, you know, after they, they, they felt their victory. We would get a beautiful Nepal, transformed Nepal. Everyone has, a, you know, would enjoy, you know, uh, the new, in, in new Nepal. Everyone has a rights. Those dreams completely gone today. Political, because of political uh, differences, no one can trust each other. Now there is a chief justice in, power, in, 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 in Nepal, power, in cabinet. The prime minister of Nepal is the chief justice, sitting chief, chief justice of Nepal. Can you imagine? Sitting Chief Justice uh, was picked up by political parties. Now he's a prime minister of Nepal. Mm -hmm. and, and to explain kind of from our system, so there's the, the differentiation between the different parts of government, legislative, executive, and judicial. And it's supposed to be run by the group that's elected by the people, which would be the legislative or the um, executive. And in the case of Nepal, because they couldn't pass this um, cons the constitution in the time required, they had to dissolve this constitutional assembly that you saw, the big parliament that they voted on. So that was dissolved, and they still couldn't agree on how to move forward. And so they made they came up with an agreement with a small group of the key parties to actually have the sitting chief justice of the Supreme Court, judicial, pull him over, even though he has nothing to do with elections and shouldn't have anything to do with that section. So outside of the rule of law, outside of their own constitution, and he is now trying to get elections to move forward. And we met with the U.S. State Department last month and brought that up as an issue. And our position as a government, the U.S. government, is it doesn't matter. Whatever they come up with to try to move the elections forward, we think the elections will solve everything. And if you're from Nepal, you know that there were elections, and they sat there for five years and couldn't get this constitution passed. So that's not going to be the final answer. Um, so there's still a lot of concern around what will happen. But there are elections that will be moving forward, possibly in November, that the Carter Center, who is actually in Nepal, will probably monitor. Yeah, the, the unpre unprecedented is, uh, so far, the new, go new government hasn't been able to declare the new, uh, new uh, election day. And the, the political, entire political scenario is divided in two, and one group is supporting to this political mob, and another group is, is uh, you know, opposing. They are demonstra demonstrating against, protesting against uh, this new political development. So uh, I, uh, people uh, are, and the international community is, is confused what, what would happen next, what is next. Mm -hmm. So the, the main, three main aim, goal, wa um, <coughs> uh, were you know, uh, in the peace agreement that happened in 2006. The, uh, the main goal you know, was uh, the, the new constitution. To, to reform the new you know, po political system, Nepal's political system, and Nepalese people, they have been demanding and asking and you know, fighting for, for new constitution that couldn't be happened uh, within the uh, given date. And uh, because of that, the constitution assembly, I mean, because of political differences, constitution assembly dissolved. Uh, we don't know not sure when we will get a new constitution. Second thing was justice. Political parties and Maoists they agreed with to form, you know, the transitional mechanism, uh, truth and reconciliation commission, disappearance commission, within a 60 days of, you know, signature date. It's been six years. Uh, you know, we, we don't know how long, how how many years it would take to establish those mechanisms. And the third thing is a peace peace uh, uh, process. Peace process is completely failed. 19,000 Maoist uh, um, uh, armies, they were in a different cantonment. 
and there was an agreement in peace, uh, peace uh, accord, uh, comprehensive peace uh, agreement, that there would be a new national army after the integration of between Maoist army and uh, Nepal army. Nepal army was the you know family army, king's army, to support not not to protect country but to protect. They did they demonstrated that they tried to protect the monarch. And the Maoist army is completely a party's army, not the national army. So to get a new, to form a new army, national army, and there was an agreement of integration between two armies and the next new army, national army. Now, thousand, around 1,000 uh, people, uh, Liberation Army, PLA, or Mao's rebel, cadres, whatever, they are in the process of recruitment, not the integration. Integration, uh, integration and the, uh, recruitment is completely different. Mixing two armies for new army, and the whole army is recruiting those people, and they are getting training, and, and they are frustrated. Mm, most of them, they have already given off the training, uh, and it's, it's still going on. Uh, last week there was a press con conference from the army that it would take a long time, it's still a long time. So three main goal of Nepalese people and, and political parties and the governments, uh, according to the peace agreement, is completely uh, gone. Peace agreement fell, no justice, and no constitution. So mm. people, you know, what is going to be happen there next? If they, you know, some some groups are talking, you know, oh peace, we have peace, peace agreement, we 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 are succeeded, but without justice, thousands of people they are in the street asking for justice, without fulfilling their demands, without delivering just justice, they would not be peace. So peace and justice are interrelated things. Mm -hmm. Without I justice, without Peace. I mean, there, there will not be peace. Mm. So it's the update. Okay. I'd like to ask you a question, Jivan. What would it take to convene a Truth and Reconciliation Committee Commission? What would it take for that to happen? Well, it did. It, it has, but it's going to not happen. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or to revive it. <laughs> yeah. Then. Or it's gonna yeah. Happen. Initially, you know, initially, political parties they were so excited. Oh, we will do. You know, everyone political leaders were there talking. Oh, we will, we will do. Whatever we have done, that is for, for you, people. We will do, we will deliver justice. But the differences, they couldn't come together. They didn't have a concrete you know, agendas. And the you know, most important thing is, is those perpetrators who were involved in torture, grave human rights violation, they were enjoying in the power after the political change. It's still they are in, in the power. They are minister, they are army general, they have been you know, you know, promoted, awarded, and, and the victims community, poor victims. They have been you know, uh, you know, protesting you know, Kathmandu. You, you saw in the videos how remote areas, you know, no, no journey, no, you know, I mean, uh, transportation facilities, no roads, no buses, so people have to come to Kathmandu. To, for their official purpose, seven, seven eight days, you know, ten days walking. If you, if you, you know, uh, from the western border, if you go to Kathmandu, it takes, sometimes it, it takes weeks because of, you know, strike, bandus. And so, peop, you know, they have been struggling financially, socially, and now they are divided by political power. And, and for PDI, Peace Brigades International, we um, 
are working with a number of groups. We're accompanying, you saw the woman whose daughter had been killed. Um, we accompany her. We accompany a number of women's groups as well that are in the south in that Troy area, a lot of them journalists trying to report that are being targeted. Another group called Advocacy Forum that's working with the victims groups as well to bring it forward, and then Jitman Baznet and his group. Um, as far as the Truth and Justice Commission, um, what has happened is they've, they've tried to push it forward, but in a very weakened state so that what would happen is there are some key players, including the Attorney General, who's been quite corrupt in the past, that could override or throw out any of the cases. And as also part of the process, there's an amnesty clause included in it that would allow amnesty for any of the conflict um, revolution era um, crimes on either side. So the Maoists now, who have had a lot of people killed and injured by the army, and the army who's still in power are kind of joining hands and agreeing to sign this kind of legislation or, or peace going forward that would allow amnesty to both sides. Now what's happened since then is the UN has come out and the UN Navi Pile, who's the high commissioner, has written a really important report in October, November of last year saying that that won't work, that it's against international law, that under international law you can't give amnesty to people that commit crimes, war crimes, and so that both sides, and she's done a whole series of documentations. Jitman's also worked with a group called Trial, um, which is a Swiss law firm, and they've just written a report that they sent him yesterday, actually, um, that talks about all these abuses and the cases and the fact that this Truth and Justice Reconciliation Committee will not work, that it's, it's against international law, that it's allowing amnesty for all of the victims. And so they've, they've moved it forward, but they've tried to do it in a watered down way. And in fact, Jitman didn't mention, but um, he's got so many things that he's involved with. But the reason that he was uh, attempted attacked on him in June 2011, before he came to the US, when PBI was accompanying him, was because he was part of a major UN conference in Nepal that was beamed all over the country that was, he was arguing that they couldn't have a watered down Truth and Justice Commission, that it needed to have teeth in it, that it needed to be something that could actually move forward and stop impunity. And so we believe that that's one of the reasons that he was threatened and targeted was because those people that are responsible, both in the army, who knows, and the police, who've been promoted, and possibly even the Maoist side, none of them want this to go forward um, and to have, you know, to, to be able to have the, the crimes prosecuted and to move forward because then they're all going to be guilty. And so that's a big piece of it. Perhaps yeah. we could open it up to questions yeah, now. And then at the last, it would be nice to address uh, what can we as Americans, as people living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, what can we do to, to help mm -hmm. some of the suffering we saw in the film? Yeah. Ravi? Yes. It sounds like, um, from what you're saying, since the, the power, there was a shift in power, and uh, the Maoist leader came into the, uh, won the election. That was only in name. It seems, sounds like mm -hmm. you're saying that the, the, there was n really no mm -hmm. change. The, the people who were powerful before are still powerful now. Mm -hmm. There wasn't much of a transition. Mm -hmm. uh, have there been any positive developments since, the, since that election that you can tell us about? Unfortunately, no. Uh, yeah, Mao won the election. And uh, they didn't get the, you know, uh, majority, but they were, uh, Maoist was the biggest party, became, became the major political parties, number one political parties after the election. They got, they didn't get the majority. The problem of Maoist, they, when, you know, uh, they got the position, power, their voices, you know, is changed. Mm -hmm. They changed their, you know, uh, their promise. Whatever they promised before the people, they, they completely, they, they are sold out now. Maoist, Maoist leaders and, and the army generals, they are in the same position. They are shaking hands, they are talking. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, I give one example. One army colonel was arrested in, in the UK. He was involved in torture uh, in, in barrack in Thorai. Uh, many people were tortured by him in, in, uh, during the conflict period. And, and he was in the peace mission, in, uh, in UN peace mission. And he, you know, he, he was in the UK in January, and he was arrested by the UK government in the police. Um, 
you know, under the universal jurisdiction. And Prime Minister Baburam Bhattarai was the Maoist leader. He wrote the letter to British government, David Cameron, to release him. And what they say, not only later, they put pressure, they, they called, they protested. They called um, um, UK MBC, the pro foreign minister office, and handed over a letter, protest letter. They paid a huge amount of money for lawyer. The same lawyer worked for the uh, Chile, what is Pinochet. it? Pinochet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, case. The same lawyer, they paid 50,000, 50, 100,000 um, pounds they paid for lawyers. And they helped, they provided money for, for bond. Mm -hmm. So it's one e example. There are millions of other examples. So they are together now because they want, they want a safe side. Those faces, bloody faces from Mao side and government side, I mean, army side, police side, they are together. You know, they are building, you know, safe side protection mm. and victim side, they are always poor. Mm. You know, uh, Susan asked me, you know, the reason, one of the reason, uh, uh, you know, TRC, First Re Reconciliation Commission, uh, was our, our position, victim position was, was divided and, and very poor, weak. Victims groups you know, di are divided. So there is no development, pol political development. It, we, it's, it's getting down, not getting up. It's, it's going down, mm. unfortunately. Another question? Maureen? Jitman. 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 <laughs> Jitman. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I'm concerned that I do not understand, you know, the, the which group and what group, and it just seemed like a whole mess of fighting, and who, yeah. who uh, imprisoned you? Hmm. Oh, yeah. I was, I was not involved, mm, and I don't believe in any violent activities. And I was not even, I, I was not a member, active member of any political parties. First, in 2002, I was, uh, because I, I was writing, you know, news, articles, you know, I was involved in, in journalism, journalistic field, and I was an editor of a magazine, and I, I was a lawyer, I, I used to help support to other victims. And first, in 2002, I was, uh, I was traveling to Solokumbu in, in, in Ramishab district, but I was heading to Solokumbu uh, to visit my parents' home. And on the way, uh, there was a Maoist gate, and I was interrogated and, and uh, captured by Maoists and tortured because I had published a couple of a number of articles uh, about their, you know, uh, human rights, their involvement in human rights abuses. Later, the government side. So I'm I'm uh, I'm the victim from the both side, mm -hmm. but the government side was very terrible because it was long, mm -hmm. and government government had jail and police and they can prosecute me. You know I would be so happy if they had put me in jail. With a formal charge, but they didn't do. They put us, they kept us, they detained us underground. And with the extreme torture killing you know number of people so it was from you know there are millions of other other you know hundreds thousands of people suffered from both sides displaced everyone Nepalese uh, you know has suffered directly or indirectly it's a conflict you know their family members their friends their uh, you know yeah parents brothers sisters you know they have they were suffered. So I am, I was suffered from both sides, I would say. Um, so, 